All right. So uh, most of you guys are doing actual cataloging today. I mean, you're, you're actually getting in there and messing with the records or creating new records. And that's what we're really going to focus on. So what we talked about yesterday, for those of you who were here, with the item level cataloging, there will be a little bit of overlap, but not a huge amount. So if you weren't here and there's things that don't quite make sense, check back on uh, the slides that are available in the knowledge book and in the best practices from yesterday and uh, just see what we went over and you should be fine. <clears throat> All right. So today we're going to do three main tasks. That seems like not much. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> identifying and creating high quality records is basically going to be almost the entire day. So that's, that's going to take up a lot of time. Before that, we're going to talk about what you do as a bibliographic cataloger. And then we're going to close up with preparing for your assessment for this. So it will be a pretty full day, but we'll try to make it fun and give you guys some time to do some exercises on your own and, of course, some time to socialize and go buy coffee and all that. So here is sort of the workflow for NC Cardinal. And for you guys, as bibliographic catalogers, you do all of this. So you can create volume and item level records, but you also work with that bibliographic record, the title record, that is sort of owned by everybody in the consortium. That's a lot of power because you can do something really great that, you know, create or alter a record so that other people have this beautiful, wonderful record they can use, or you could potentially mess the record up so everybody has a weird record that they don't want to use. This happens. Um, so it's a lot of power, but you do have that responsibility um, to sort of figure out what you're doing so that you create the wonderful records and fewer, though certainly not never, but fewer of the oh my god, what were they thinking records. We all have those. There, there are days. There are days when you don't get your coffee or you don't feel well or your brain just isn't working and something goes wrong and that's okay. <clears throat> As bibliographic catalogers, you should be able to do all of the tasks that were required of item catalogers, so you should be able to evaluate and select good bibliographic records that are already in the catalog for resources that come across your desk. You should be able to create volume numbers and item records, add item attributes where appropriate. You should be able to add items or records to buckets if need be and you should be able to delete items and volumes. In addition to those things that item catalogers do and that you should be able to do, you have a number of other responsibilities. So as bibliographic catalogers, you should be able to import bibliographic records and overlay them when necessary. You should be able to create bibliographic records, and we're, that's, we're going to spend some time on that today. You should be able to merge duplicate bibliographic records, so you should be able to identify when things are duplicates of the same thing and not just very similar, and then merge those. You should be able to edit bibliographic records so that you can do things like add RDA fields, update information so that it's following rules that NC Cardinal has agreed upon, or create, rec you know, create ways in those records for the information to be more accessible for your patrons. So things like adding and editing subject headings are sort of part of that. You should be able to find that vocabulary and add it to a record or edit subject headings that aren't up to snuff. So those that's a fair amount of stuff. It seems like a short list and then you start thinking about how complex it gets and it can be a little overwhelming, but we're going to go through all of it today 
and there are ways that you can get more in depth with a lot of these topics, especially the more general ones of creating and editing records and doing subject headings, and we'll talk about that as we go forward today. Since you have more power, you also have more rules, um, et more etiquette rules for your cataloging because there are certain things that you uh, should and should not do when you can, in fact, like get rid of other people's stuff relatively easily um, <clears throat> or alter other people's stuff in interesting ways relatively easily. So definitely, and I'll say this a million times today just like I did yesterday, consult to the best practices document often. It is a document that is in constant flux at the moment and will continue to be changed fairly frequently in the future. So there is a link to this in the slideshow. Um, you can see here you've got the best practices. You can see where we spent time yesterday. So you do have a cataloging overview that can give you some basic rules, item cataloging, You've got stuff that will guide you through a lot of the processes in bibliographic cataloging. Because you have these instructions um, that are specific to working in Evergreen, I'm not really going to cover much, if any, of this stuff today. So how you search Z7950 and bring records in, or how you actually do a merge or an overlay of records. That's outlined here, so we're going to talk more about the mechanics of the cataloging specifically. You have these lovely mark templates. These are going to be magical for you when you're creating records especially. This makes life so much easier. I mean, if you have an audiobook, you can go into the template and it tells you what fixed fields get what values and uh, it tells you, it gives you the 007. Yay, you don't have to come up with that on your own. We're going to talk about reading that today. Um, it gives you basically the stuff that should be in that record. It's really nice having those templates there. And then you have various appendices that walk you through everything from you have a place where you can grab your 007 fields and copy and paste them into your records. Uh, you've got a place where you can learn more about the fixed fields, the 008s, leaders, all of that. So this is a pretty handy resource and it's something you should definitely check on frequently. You should also, as much as possible, correct errors in existing records. I realize some days that you have very little time and that you're just trying to turn out the numbers so that your administrator who maybe doesn't quite understand what you do will be happy that you cataloged such and such number of things in the uh, in the month. Um, done that before. Those are the sorts of things that you could save for later and then go back and correct the errors when you have a little more time. But the main thing is to, especially if there are glaring gigantic errors, make sure that you're fixing those. So it's going to help with access to these resources and it'll also make it so that you or somebody else in the consortium won't have to spend the time on that later. So you're just sort of investing in your future with that. When you find incomplete or brief records in the catalog, you should either add information or merge them with better records that match them. You should use the MARC templates so that you can evaluate RDA records, evaluate records that maybe are not RDA and figure out what's going on, and also so you can create records. And you should delete empty bibliographic records following the following rules. If they are empty, if they were created more than four months ago, and if they have no items, and if they are not an electronic resource. So you, for this one, if you're starting to find a lot of empty bib records or you set yourself the um, task that you're going to get rid of these because they are irritating, 
make yourself a checklist and make sure you've checked everything on that list before you delete that because you could end up deleting a record for an e-resource that somebody kind of needed or you could delete something that somebody had sitting there that they were holding for something that's going to come in next week or you know something weird like that so those are that's your checklist for deleting those but once you've checked them all off delete the record get rid of that record <coughs> Uh, another thing, don't assume that any record is correct or incorrect. Always double check it so it doesn't matter who created the record, who's altered the record. Uh, when it was created, you may think, oh, you know, it's a record from 2018. It must follow RDA rules. Not necessarily. <laughs> double check those records just to be sure. Make sure that you've got the best one and that it is accurate. Do not delete OCLC numbers from the record, so the 035 tag. 035s for other numbers, get rid of them. But OCLC numbers you should keep because that's going to be instrumental when uh, computer programs run deduping programs or when you're, somebody's trying to import something in and you could set up a way so that they can't import something with the exact same OCLC number. There are lots of things that can be done with that OCLC number, so don't delete those. Don't delete or edit the 082. It's the recommended Dewey classification number. You can certainly do a different one or create a new one for your catalog record and you put that into your volume record, but don't change the 082 field for everybody else because that is a good reference. And I realize some of them may be completely out of date. It may say that it's from like the 14th edition of Dewey Decimal Classification. Go ahead and just leave it. If you're really concerned about it, put something up on the listserv for the cataloging committee and say, you know, this particular record has a really old Dewey Decimal number and, you know, maybe they'll decide to approve somebody to update it, but you don't want to change those just willy-nilly on your own because you may be having one of those off days and now you've had everybody shelf it in the wrong place. <laughs> um, make sure you add this or that you add a series to the resource, but do not add that series name to the title in the 245 tag. So series information, we're going to talk about this later, but series information should go in the 490 and if at all possible, an 8xx field. But it should not go in that title tag, the 245. That's something that a lot of people did because their old ILSs before they got to this one weren't handling series statements well, and they wanted it to be there for their patrons. So when you find those, don't judge, um, but change them. <laughs> and don't do it yourself because that, that actually messes up access to the series for the most part. And there are weird exceptions to that where the name of the series is also the name of the book, but in that case you're gonna know like this is the title of the book. Okay, I'll put it here and I'll put it in the series, it's fine, whatever. But when that's the title, it can go in the title field, not when it's the name of the series. Don't change the title of a periodical by adding a year or issue designation to that title of a periodical. Now you've messed up the record so nobody can use it except for that one year or that one issue. And the beauty with the periodical records is that you can keep using these as long as that magazine or whatever is in existence and as long as it is um, using that same title that it has. So be careful with those. And do not delete items with open transactions. And there's a list of what open transactions are in the best practices in case you can't remember those from yesterday or weren't here yesterday and don't know what they are. Things like checked out. Don't delete something that's checked out. Um, 